Hello all, welcome to part two in our series on Mozart's third violin concerto, first movement. Um, in this segment, I'm just going to go through parts of the movement and we'll talk about some of the issues that arise so that we can get a sense of some specific considerations that come into play as we're, as we're playing this music. So um, in general, it's always, you know, if you're playing it with an orchestra, it's a good idea for the soloist to play the opening tutti um, in this period. You're basically the concertmaster soloist. They wouldn't have had a they wouldn't have had a conductor, as as we think of a conductor. So the the concertmaster would lead the band, um, and that's a that's a good thing to do if you're certainly if you're playing with an orchestra. But that said, I'm going to dive right in uh, where the solo part begins in earnest at measure 38, um, just because starting from there we'll we'll get a sense of the main issues that that we face in the movement anyway. So right from the very first chord. Um, we have some issues to consider. Uh, first one, I think, is, is simply character. What, what kind of a character um, do we want from this? Sometimes when we think of Mozart, we, th we think of something, you know, small, dainty, maybe a little cutesy. Um, and I mean, I'm not saying that Mozart couldn't summon those characters when he wanted to, right? Mozart is, a, is an operatic composer. He's a playwright. He's a, he's a Shakespeare. Um, and so he has all sorts of different characters in his music. But I think the undertone to all of that is something very splendid. Um, if you've ever seen um, Salzburg, where, where Mozart grew up, right? it's, a, it's a gorgeous medieval city. Um, the, it, it's, it's just a splendid, splendid town. And I think, I think that sort of splendor is the undertone of a lot of Mozart's concerto and symphonic writing. Um, so I think we can, we can think big and grand and, and splendid. Um, the, the trick is how do we do that on the modern violin? Because especially on the modern instrument with, a, you know, the, that's very tightly strung, metal strings, high-powered bow, you know, it's, if, we, if we think about a big chord, sometimes the, you know, in an effort to make it not sound like Sibelius, um, we, we kind of scale back a little bit. I've seen um, footage of some, some of the very great violinists of the 20th century performing and they'll start, you know, up here and just use a little bit of bow because actually the sound is very nice up there. Or sometimes even up bow. Um, but, but the net result is that the sound is nice but, but very small. I think we can actually go for something bigger, bigger and grander, but so that it doesn't sound like Sibelius. What we want to do is just get as a, an easy, open resonance. We don't want to feel like we're forcing the instrument at all. We just want to catch, catch the D string and roll to the E string so that we can get as much open as much open resonance as we possibly can getting a very easy but full and splendid sound um, okay so right from the beginning what are some issues that we've got there so after the first chord we, we have the second note it's very easy in this gesture, which recurs in a lot of Mozart's music, even in you know, the fifth concerto. We often have this bum bum ya da da rum bum ya. That, that sort of figure is all over the place in Mozart's writing. And it's very tempting to hit the second note more than the first, so we have to be really careful of that. Um, I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, but we, but we hear that, that quite a lot. Um, same thing here. It's easy to hit the second note, especially if we go, as you know, a lot of additions uh, I mentioned in the, in the first video, we'll split that bowing, even though it's not really what Mozart wrote. And then sometimes that's a, that's a common bowing to do up, down. Um, but once again, I mentioned in the first video that we want to, wherever possible, really try to make the down bows correspond with down beats. My point is that we have to be really careful that when we have that one, two, one, two, sort of a figure that we don't hit the second beat more strongly than the first. We want to let the first beat ring, and yes, we want to be, be full and, and, and strong on the second beat, but not, not more so than the first. So that's, that's something important to keep in mind. Um, one slur on those last four. Some editions will have a represent that as two equal eighth notes. That's not what Mozart writes. He writes a sixteenth appoggiatura, or a sixteenth grace note, followed by a quarter, so it would be a short, a short little snap on the beat. Now there he does write out two eighth notes, so that's, that's a little bit different. Now instead of having a snap, we really want to 
lay on those. And just as we discussed in the first video, have a little bit of separation in the, in the sound after the two-note slur, so the two-note slurs always release. Okay, so at the end of that fourth measure, our, our third note of the bar, the last note that we play in the bar, there's a little carrot over the last note. Um, that carrot in Mozart just means short. Um, sometimes, much later composers used a, a wedge figure to indicate an accent. Um, that's not what it means. Um, for example, in another place, in, in the fifth concerto, the beautiful theme of the second movement, that first note has, has a little stroke over it. It means short. It doesn't mean hiccup, um, but it means not legato. So we're not going to sustain like that. It's like a it's like a, a vocal an expressive vocal note that has a release at the end. So so whenever we see a a stroke in Mozart, it just means short, and it can have all sorts of different characters. In this case, I think it just means a, a nice, quick, light release. Um, this might be a good place at the end of this first phrase to just talk a little bit about sound production in. In Mozart. So, especially since this is often one of the first mainstream concertos that violinists study, um, sometimes, you know, sound production can be something that's really at, at the fore of something that we have to figure out how to, how to do in, in this piece. So, a couple of things that I've sometimes seen that we want to be careful to avoid. One is um, hitting the bow against the string too much, because there is a, this music has a lot of natural lifts. It's one thing that makes it challenging. Um, but if I go... <coughs> And, you know, and all the lifts are kind of up, and then I hit the bow down on the instrument. Obviously, that's not a, a very elegant way of playing. We want to... The analogy I sometimes use with students is that when you're landing the bow, it's like when a plane comes in for landing. It never just comes down and hits the runway. It levels out a little bit. You come in above and then level out, and there's that moment where you just have that absolute control, and then you touch down. Um, so we want to think about the sound, even while having a vertical dimension, to being very elegant in how it enters the string and, and kind of coaxing the sound out of the instrument. Um, the other thing that I've sometimes seen is if we have a tendency to move the move the violin in the same direction as the bow, so that the bow almost kind of pulls pulls us back around with it. Um, if we do that, basically we're losing all of the energy of the bow. It's like you know we poke a hole in our tire or something. So to counter that, if we have this general feeling of let's say we have a down bow. We feel the bow sinking down into the string and at the same time we can feel the violin resisting that even to the point maybe of rising just a little bit. And then similarly on an up bow we kind of recover that. We, we have like, it's like an inhale. So we exhale on the down bow and then inhale we re recover toward the frog to prepare for the next down bow. If we can have that kind of binary feeling um, throughout the whole thing, that will really enliven our articulation. And to do that, we want to make sure that we're not just moving in the same direction, that we're really feeling the violin have a kind of resistance against the bow, so that the bow, even while being very articulate, can really sink into the string, and within each stroke, between articulations, can really get a nice full sound. So instead of... We don't want a surfacey sound. Very important in Mozart that the sound be really as as full as we can make it. Again, it's not it's not light wispy music. In fact, Leopold Mozart, Amadeus's father, uh, in his violin treatise, um, repeatedly mentions. Now, it's not the <laughs> the most um, sensitive or <laughs> politically correct way of phrasing things, but he talks about making sure that students have, he's often talking about using thick enough strings so that a student can draw a robust masculine sound. The point is that he wants he wants a robust sound, um, and he's very clear about that. So we don't want to force the sound, and gut strings require us to, in, in Leopold's words again, begin each note with softness. And he doesn't, you know, we don't mean a seasick sort of swell, but it does mean that we can't just hit the string. We have to, we have to ease our way in and then just open the sound up from there. So if we think about that kind of sound production, I think that's going to really put us in a good direction um, for approaching this music. Uh, new location. <laughs> All right, so let's let's go on to the next phrase here. So what are some things we 
you've got going on here. Um, this is a good example of a place where Mozart uses the, the classical bow that has a little bit more weight at the tip than... A, I'm, I'm using a modern bow here, but the, the, the classical bow that Mozart would have been using would have a little bit more weight than the Baroque bow that allows you to be a little bit more flexible with this so-called rule of the down bow. Really the most natural down, ma most natural bowing I feel is, is for yeah, this, this downbeat, the high point of the phrase and the downbeat to arrive on an up bow. So we have to kind of counterfeit the feeling of a down bow with a very, you know, a lot of, a lot of sound, a lot of, you know, bow speed and, and enough weight into the string to, to make it really ring. And then if we can play really hearing the skeleton under the, the, the notes on the surface that we hear, kind of a syncopation. And then I tend to start this measure of eighth notes nice and a, bit, a little bit less and lead into here. Now whenever we have, when we have this figure walking down, oftentimes we hear with almost an emphasis on the eighth notes, I would actually do the opposite. Um, Mozart's two-note slurs, again, always indicate some kind of coming away toward the end of the slur, and I think the fact that he gives us two-note slurs means that he wants us to really hear the first note. So what we get there is a... that simple descending scale. Obviously enough sound on the second note, I'm not suggesting we come away. But, but the, what I do is I actually lighten the weight and, and let the, the bow speed just kind of spin the sound. And then a short appoggiatura there, and long appoggiatura on the next one. Um, you'll see that in the if you're looking at the Baron Rider or a similar edition. Um, that that's how he, how he phrases it. Okay, good. Our next entrance... Um, So some things that we've got going on here right from the start. Again, we want to just make sure that we're really in the string and getting a nice full resonant sound, while at the same time not being uber legato. I think that's probably not what we're going for. It's, it's connected, but it's not. It's not gooey, right? We want to have even if we even if the voice continues to sing, we want to feel like each note is kind of its own syllable. Um, for me, there's nothing really to indicate this, um, but I tend to feel a bit of a different character here. And then echoed down an octave. You know, did you hear that? Right? It, it, you have to imagine operatic characters, because that's the thing about Mozart. His music is so operatic. It's full of one character changing to another. Um, and, it, you know, and if you go back, you know, 50 years, to the you know the baroque ideal of a concerto and you, you know when you play bach concertos um the idea is that you have one main character or affect per movement and that is completely blown out of the water by mozart's time um the the lifeblood of mozart's music is having these different characters coming back and forth and in fact that's one one thing that makes makes playing mozart so difficult is that you're always having to change on a dime you're having to be this character and then this character and then they go back and forth um then this other character comes in right it, it, it really is in terms of even just you know the mind and keeping track of of the the feeling of each character and the distinct personality of each character it really keeps us mentally on the ball and then of course producing the sound we want for for each one. Um, so I I sing this, change the character and then again, and then the singing comes back but with a little bit more playfulness and with all of these bowings. I arrive down bow, and then to make sure that the next bow, next downbeat is also down bow, I retake the up bow. Again, so you see how I'm kind of always planning the bowing so that wherever possible I can land down bow on a downbeat. We, we, we have, once we get to that downbeat, we, we don't know where it's going to go, but we have, and it just stops. Rest. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's almost awkward writing 
but I mean, it, it's so it's so skillful. It doesn't it doesn't feel awkward. It feels like the character is being awkward, maybe. <laughs> so we try to go back. No, okay. So we've just come back to where we are. Right, it, I think we have to really feel the humor in each of, each one of those steps. <laughs> and then, oh well, whatever. Um, so we break out of that mold, and then, oh yeah, and now here, I, I've often seen some 20th century editions represent, kind of break up this slurring, but Mozart actually writes in, in one long slur, which I think is very interesting, because it, it gives it almost a more, it's almost like flattering or saccharine or something, it's almost a little over the top, you know, so short. You know, and whether you hear it that way or not, you know, that's that's open to interpretation. But my point is that those characters need to be radically different. Now here we have the forte and the piano. Um, again, a lot of 20th century editions represent it as forte, diminuendo, piano, crescendo, forte. Um, for me, that, that misses the feeling a little bit. I don't, I don't think also that it needs to be like sustain the forte absolutely to the tip of the bow and then you know the super dope piano on the next one i don't feel like the the last of those has to be super forte and then an absolute contrast with the next one but i think what we want to feel is a contrast of half notes so the ha the half note on the downbeat is forte the half note on the second beat is piano the half note on the downbeat is forte the half half note on the second or as i should say the second half of the measure is is piano um, so within the, within the, you know, thinking of period style, if that's one half note, there's going to be naturally some decay, but it can still end louder than the next one begins. So I think as long as we're feeling it in half notes rather than just 16th notes, we'll, we'll be okay. So loud half note, soft half note, loud half note, soft half note. Um, I think that's the trick there. Um, here, Mozart writes a series of long appoggiatures. Um, if if we were to render them as eighth notes, it gets it gets very boring and you know very square. Um, they should be approximately eighth notes, but maybe some a little more, some a little less. You know, there are all sorts of ways that you can do it, but but never I would say never the same. That, that we always are aware that there, it's a a grace note preceding a quarter, rather than just a, a series of straight eighth notes. Um, okay. There have been all sorts of renderings of this one that I often see is um, a two-note ricochet. Um, it, it, that's, that's, again, not a, a bowing that I would associate with Mozart's time or with the bows that Mozart would have been using. Um, I, think, I think we come a little closer to the stroke if we just simply do a Maybe just start a little bit of, little bit above the string, or have a little bit of verticality to the. I'm I'm almost on the string, and just a little bit of spring in the stroke. Not a heavy, you know, not a heavy spiccato or anything like that. Just a little spring. Um, parenthetically, it might also be interesting to know that a springing bow stroke was associated with. Um, some of the composers of Mozart's time, you know, the Mannheim and, and whatnot, um, in, in a way that actually wasn't as much later. So, so with the development of the modern bow, the, the school that became predominant of, of um, the, the, the school of playing Viotti, um, Spohr, uh, De Berio, or composers like this would, would have a lot of on, on the string, especially emphasizing the upper half of the bow, which had been not an area of the Baroque bow that you could use much, right, beyond just kind of releasing the sound. But with this, with the modern bow design, suddenly we had a lot more weight at the tip and this kind of suspension bridge design to distribute the weight to that point. So suddenly now we have these kind of bow strokes coming into play. And the, the, the Viotti school of playing, which is, a, you know, known for its broad, bold tone, um, stayed almost exclusively on the, on the string. Um, and this, the springing bow stroke was thought of a, thought of as a, as a thing of the past, but, um, that belonged more to Mozart's time. Um, then P Paganini preserved springing bow strokes and with Mendelssohn, it starts coming back into the kind of 
what we tend to think of as the mainstream um, repertoire. Uh, a lot of the German composers started using a spring English hook a little bit more uh, after that time. But uh, for a while it was actually considered passé. But it did belong to Mozart's time, so we can, we can have a little spring in that stroke. And again, totally different change, of, total, total change of character now. And then, then, and you know, leaning on that downbeat, and then we try again. So maybe, oh, didn't you like the first one? You know, again, asking some question or doing something in our mind to make it rhetorical, to make it operatic. Oh no, no, it's fine. And, and this one is interesting because whereas the first one was in two bows, this one is in one bow, so I start it up bow. And this can actually be a place where we, where we have a bit of an invitation to do a bit of glissando in that downward shift. In the, in the first video I talked about how shifting under a slur and the resulting glissando was something that was newly coming into vogue um, in this period. And then we have Again, a change of character. And here, we again, we can see how Mozart is using changes in the bow to defy that rule of the down bow. Down, up. An impulse on the down bow and an impulse on the up bow. So for all of those, again, a, a small string, start close to the string. So it's just... And at the end of every two note slur, we want to have a release. So we want to imagine that the rhythm is like a staccato eighth note. Um, oftentimes I hear it, the, the slurs being basically legato into the third note. And I think we want to, we want to avoid that. It, it won't be as, as clean and, and, uh, and scintillating an articulation. Um, so then, going on, same, same thing, just making sure each of those two note slurs release. Um, okay, so now I'm looking at measure 76. Um, some people do that on the G string. Um, either way, I think, you know, we, we want to imitate, uh, you know, the sound of horns and oboes. So a nice, a nice, pure, open sound. That's why I don't mind the open D. And, and you'll notice I'm playing those half notes quite full, but not not legato. I'm not going. I touched on that a bit in the first video. Um, that we want to just have that little bit of detachment so that each note has its own, like a like a horn articulation almost. Um, Seventy eight has a unison on the downbeat. So we, we can make sure that we do that. Some additions don't represent that because it's a little bit of a rougher sound, perhaps, than, it, than kind of the 20th century sheen. But Mozart does write; he wants he wants that that unison. Um, same thing, incidentally, at the beat, at the opening of the Tutti of the Fourth Concerto. There's that unison that gives us that, that a little bit more rustic sound somehow, and, and Mozart does call for that at times. Okay, so after that first note, where I release a little bit, right, we don't want, we don't want legato, we want a bit of release, and then, so you'll see what I do in order to get back to the down bow, um, instead of, instead of doing that all up, down, up, down, up, I think, I know I've talked about violating the rule of the down bow, for me that feels like a little too much violation, um, especially by the time we get to the top really does, this top note does want to be down bow. So, so what I do is I uh, follow Leopold Mozart's prescription to do two consecutive up bows. Now, I'm not doing a, I'm not doing an up bow staccato, um, like, you know, something in the middle of the Glazunov concerto or something, but it's just, I'm also not doing a, a complete slur. I don't know if you can see on the camera, just, I'm doing a little, little gentle re-articulation, but I'm essentially keeping the bow on the string. And, and that'll, that will be good enough. Um, oftentimes I hear... 
and, and almost an, an accent on the on the trill. Um, but we want to remember that right the, the the downbeat is where we have the cadential six four chord, which is actually the the dissonance. And then it resolved. The trill is actually is a resolution of that. So the downbeat represents where the dissonance is, the the D over the A, but we play an F sharp. But the, the, the four three. So really, we almost want to imagine that the the, the downbeat is a long appoggiatura that resolves into the E. I think that'll that'll be very elegant. Um, Okay, so we, we get to this next long note. This is a wonderful place to do uh, what I talked about on the first video, which is a mesa di voce on a long. So on a, the idea is that on a long note, we have this kind of growing. We grow with the bow and add a little bit of vibrato in the middle to give it a very vocal quality. That's one of the places where vibrato would have been. Um, common usage in, in Mozart's period. Um, okay, this is next next bit. Um, this so he we have a, a thirty second grace followed by two sixteenths. Um, I've sometimes seen that represented in additions as as a triplet sixteenth. Um, I'm not sure why and I'm not sure what the what the origins of that are, but I I, I think it, from from everything I've seen, I think Mozart would have intended just two sixteenths with a snap at the beginning, and all of these. Make sure that we there's no pressure to hold the hold the last note. Up, you know, really sustain that dotted eighth. It's, it's a bit artificial, so we just want to be very brilliant and then release. And always trilling from above, and really make make something of the fact that we go down an extra octave there, right? Um, not just to A, but really down there. Um, a lot of people do that, so that we do up, down, up, down, emphasizing the up bow in the upper half of the bow. And again, that's a that's a Viotti modern bow type of playing that would have come into into use in Beethoven's day. Um, but I think with Mozart's time, it's a little more appropriate to keep the down bows on a on the the, the, the beats the strong notes on a down bow. And again, here, whatever bowing we do, whether we do down down or down up, whatever, we want to be careful not to go and emphasize the second note more than the first. Um, okay, so the development um, is awfully repetitive, which seems odd at first, but I think that's one of the things that's going to make it musically fun. We'll get there. Um, so let's just have a, a look at this opening gesture. Um, okay, so we want to just make sure that the half notes, not, not legato, just a little bit of, a little bit of re-articulation on each one. Um, these figures of a, a 16th grace preceding an 8th. Because because they're in the context of moving 16th notes, um, we're going to play them like like even 16ths themselves. Like two 16ths, two 16ths, two 16ths. Instead of... Um, that, that comes from from Turk, I believe, who gives that example. Um, we do want to make sure that when we have these slurs, again, that we just release a little bit at the end and lean a little bit more on the first note than the second. It'll just make it more more elegant and, and the articulation more, more refined. Um, then it happens again, a few measures later. Do we want to do it the same way or differently? Um, I think it would be good to do it differently, but in what way? Is it softer? Is it louder? I don't know. Um, you can figure that out and do what you like with it. But I I, uh, I think we always want to be, again, thinking of character. So in what way has this changed from the first time? Um, so this is, this is a fun figure. Again, it's Mozart kind of defying the the rule of the down bow in a wonderful way. We, there's, there's not so much around 
not too many ways of avoiding this unless we go we kind of retake that bow. I suppose that's an option. Or we can down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And just have a little bit of playfulness with the fact that we're, you know, going up, down, up, down, up, down for a while. I think that's that's legitimate in Mozart's in Mozart's time. And then really serpentine in here, right? So I think we can really enjoy that, that kind of sneaky quality to it. Um, so here, same thing, um, two sixteenths with a preceded by a sixteenth grace. I, I think that's basically identical to the what we discussed above in measure was that 84, 85. I think it's just a snap and then um, two sixteenth notes. Um, so really, I think that should be nice and strong. Um, see, we'll see there's a stroke on the E. Again, just meaning short. No, doesn't mean accent or anything. Just We already know that the D, the D is going to be short because it's under a slur. Then the E is short. And the F we know to be short because it's the last note of the phrase. See, all of these things are kind of implied in Mozart's, the performance practice of Mozart's day that his, his readers would have known. Um, um, now maybe a different character. And we can really use those two note figures to create a sighing effect. Here I do start down bow and release. Not a stroke that I would use often in Baroque music, but appropriate, I think, for the classical period, so that we can arrive down bow again. And then suddenly again, that strong character, character is yada dum bum bum he doesn't, he doesn't write it. He doesn't write forte. But it's just whenever a figure like that appears in other works, very often there's, there's a forte character to it. And of course, when the orchestra echoes us, it's, you know, unison, yada dum bum bum It's just written in a very emphatic way. So I think, I think we can make that distinction between a more kind of pleading character and and a, and a stronger or angry character or something. Um, um, and now the slurs are off the beat. So, uh, you know, obviously we don't want to accent them like that, but I'm, I'm just, you know, showing, showing that they're displaced. So we want to, we want to feel where the downbeats are by timing, but yet release into the into the strong note. So release, um, and that'll give us a feeling of syncopation, including that slur into the downbeat. Um, and I think again, it's not a that's not a bowing that you would find in Bach, say. So I think we can appreciate the playfulness with which, or the character with which Mozart's audience would have would have heard that. Okay, so now the figure comes back in in E minor. Um, and then, oh, back in D minor. Um, and at this point, we start to think, oh, what's, what's Mozart doing? I mean, it, just, it seems like it's not going anywhere. Um, but I, I'm thinking of a, a scene from uh, Le Nozze di Figaro, or The Marriage of Figaro, where the, the the characters in a garden in the garden and they're kind of like following each other around. Um, I imagine this as a an operatic scene where you know people are following each other here and there, and it's kind of this comic thing. It's like going in a circle, or like you wind up back where you start. And there's a little bit of a comic element to the fact that you're kind of scuttling around, but like not actually going anywhere. You, you hop over here, and then then you come back here. So we go from D minor to E minor, which is which is quite a tonal shift, really, isn't it? Um, and then from E minor back to D minor, and then continuing that next stepwise progression down, we go to C major. So we have this feeling like it's going up and then down and then down again. But when we come to C major, suddenly it's well, it's major, right? Yeah. Not, not the not the the minor second, but now here finally for the first time we have something that really feels like a true operatic melody. Um, um, quick note to start that, 
it's true the downbeat there's a resolution of what's come before and the the melody feels like it's starting on the second beat my feeling is that we still don't want to overly accentuate the second beat more than the first so if we can have a way of arriving at the downbeat in a way that feels like we we don't we're not crescendoing into it there's still a feeling of release but if we can make it enough in terms of substance of sound so that the second beat can feel substantial but still be under that um Um, you'll notice, so I, I retake the down bow, lighter, um, an up, another up bow again so that we can come down bow, and again a double up bow, up, up, so that we can come down bow, and then it works out. Now here again I do an up, an up bow. So, so once again, down bow on the down beats. Up, up, down, and you can you can take a, a double up somewhere else if you like. For example, here, up, down, up. Um, or I think if you wanted to do a, a virtuosic bowing, a light up bow staccato type stroke, uh, I, I don't think that would be out of place here. We find it. On either side of Mozart, Bach does something like that in the E major um, violin harpsichord sonata, and Schubert um, does it as well. And you know, uh, in addition to other examples from the classical period, but um, I think that's you know that adding bowings like that I think is very much in place. It's um, a form of ornamentation, basically. So I think I think you can feel free to do that. Um, okay, so this pickup to measure one forty two. We want to recognize that this is an ornamentation of the material that we already had when the melody started at 138. Um, and that melody very simply outlines a descending four note figure. And so even though we go, really it's the, the implied note is the B. And then here, I think we have to recognize that the descent continues to the C, except Mozart bumps it up an octave, and we have this run connecting us to that high C. So I think there we have to really feel like the line wants to sink, but there's some lyrical impulse in us that forces us up that octave. And I think that in that slur, just because of the way fingerings work, and because of the kind of fingerings they would likely have done in the period, I think that's a place where we can have some glissando. Or... one way or the other. Um, I would make the bow... I would work out the bowing so that that A... comes down bow, and once again we want to imagine that that's like a long appoggiatura to the second half note. It's almost as though the, the note that Mozart had in mind was just a G with a trill, but there was a half note, if you can imagine, a half note appoggiatura to it. Except now we add, in addition to the appoggiatura, you know, the, the A appoggiatura, as it were, then we add another short uh, appoggiatura from the top. So we actually kind of do double duty, but I think that's, I think it's an elegant solution. Okay, so then we finish out the exposition with this, you know, the funny exchange of characters. Um, after we've had this beautiful melody, something that feels a little hesitant. Right? So what are we doing here, right? Um, um, here's one of those places where uh, the, the bowing that I usually do is down, up, just so that we can, again, land down bow on the downbeat. Um, then we have a sudden forte, where we have a similar figure. Mozart doesn't write a slur over the dotted figure. He, do he doesn't write that. Um, so it's a question of judgment. Does he, does he want the figure to be the same? Or with the change from piano to forte, does he want a change of character? We could, I could also imagine that, that sort of a thing. Because you, you do find those sorts of 
short dotted figures quite a lot in classical era literature. It's almost a trumpet-like figure. If we opt for that, you'll notice that I'm not... Uh, or I'm, I'm not sustaining the A, right? I play it and retake the bow. So whenever we have a kind of a loud trumpet figure in Mozart, um, or, or music of this period, we're not going to feel a need to sustain all the way through the dotted eighth. Ba -bum, ba -bum. And, and the, the bowing that I think would have been done in the period would be to exactly what I just did too. In that release, you retake the bow. Um, and then we have fermata, which in Mozart usually means, in, in a context like this, take a short cadenza, and, and maybe a better word for cadenza uh, would be eingong or lead-in. Um, the sort of thing that a singer would do in a single breath, just to kind of have a little flourish before we get back to where we're going. So I, you can make something up. Yeah, I, I don't know, something or other. You could... There are many, many possibilities. But again, have a look at, at um, Haydn Mozart's piano writing Beethoven too. It has very similar type lead-ins. Um, see what sorts of figures composers from the period are using. And um, just come up with something something short. Maybe have a few possibilities in mind if you, if you want to improvise. Have a few options in mind that you can recombine in different ways. Um, so then, you know, whatever strikes you in the moment, you know you have the resources at hand to do that. Okay, and then we have the recapitulation, and uh, much of that is the same. The only thing remaining is the cadenza, but I'd like to touch on that in a separate video. So that will be part three, so stay tuned for that, and as always, thanks for watching.